Hey everybody, it's Mike with Insider Secrets brought to you by My Core Intentions. And today's guest is Brad Roth with ATRE, uh, the host of that podcast. Brad, say hi to our guests and tell them what they're going to be able to hear from you today. Thank you, Michael. So guys, today we are going to hear some insider secrets for investors. If you want to know, we're going to talk a little bit of shop. We're going to talk about different ways to be successful when you're investing. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. And you'll have to tune in Tuesday, 12 o'clock. Talk to you soon. Welcome to this week's edition of Insider Secrets, the show that turns multifamily investing into reality. Each show, we interview guests who are seasoned professionals actively closing and managing real estate deals. Your host, Mike Morawski, has more than 30 years of multifamily real estate investing and property management experience. Mike is the founder of My Core Intentions and has been involved in over $285 million of transactions and focuses on helping you create short-term cash flow and long-term wealth. Here's your host, Mike. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. It's Mike, your host of Insider Secrets, again, brought to you by My Core Intentions. Hope you're doing well today. Hey, I, have you been thinking a lot lately about your intentions, about your why, your goals? It's getting to be that time of year where you want to start thinking about that. So as you come into the next year, you're really able to strike while the iron's hot, right? You want to build those goals. You want to build that intention around what you're doing. So at MCI, we want to invest in our client's future. And we do that through educational platform, teaching you how to create short-term cash flow and long-term wealth. You know what? We try to empower you with sound real estate investing and property management principles, helping you live a well-balanced lifestyle. I think one of the biggest things that can happen is in the real estate business, we get so busy that our lifestyle gets out of balance, it gets distorted, and things get out of whack. And what we want to try and do is keep you in balance. So we want to develop some strong foundational practical principles around that. I share a lot of these principles in my new book I just published, which is uh, Exit Plan, your complete guide to multifamily investing and why you need an exit plan before you, you buy. So pick up a copy today at the website. If you have questions, let me know. Hey, if you're looking for some direction, give us a call. Let's jump on a, a quick call and see what we can do to maybe give you some ideas and some tips. Hey, enough of that. I'm really excited about our guest today and my my friend and real estate agent and investor, Brad Roth. Brad, would you say hi to everybody? Hey, everyone. How are you today? Glad you're here, Brad. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, you bet. Listen, let me read your bio here a little bit. Sure. Brad grew up in the San Fernando Valley. And that's in California, for those that don't know, a place that a lot of people might want to live. Definitely. He went, went on to study psychology and communications. He worked as an actor for a number of years, appearing on shows such as Beverly Hills 90210 and Saved by the Bell. But these last 20 years, he's taken that knowledge he gained and put it towards highly successful real estate career. With his focus in Southern California residential real estate, he sold over 40 homes ranging from single family and condos to luxury estates. Brad loves giving the knowledge back to those new agents and showing that show promise. Brad coaches agents, but prides himself on being more of a life coach who can help an agent navigate through their busy life and wanting to become a, more of a top producing agent. Brad's the host of the podcast, ATRE. Brad has seen many circles or many uh, cycles in the real estate markets, which has led him uh, to the foresight of being able to navigate the ups and downs of the markets. So that's what he works on when he coaches his agents through their most difficult and exciting times. Because we know that in the real estate business, we can have both. Brad? Definitely, Mike. Cool. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, a TV star. Look at that. Uh, done a couple of things here and there. Hey, Mike, Michael, just to correct you really quick, you had said 40 homes. Yeah. It's actually 400. Yeah. You know, as I read <laughs> I that, want, I, I didn't thought, want them to go, what? <laughs> as I read that, I thought, geez, that might be a typo. I might have sent you the wrong thing. I apologize. It's okay. So we, I'm glad we got that corrected, though. Yes. Because there's a little difference between 40 and 400. Just a little. Yes. Thank you for having me. 
Hey, you bet. I'm glad you're here. Hey, obviously you're a top producing real estate agent. Anybody who sells 400 houses in a career, that's a lot. And I think that one thing that maybe our listeners don't can't take into perspective unless we make this next statement is the average real estate agent in the country sells between 12 and 15 houses a year. And when you take someone who's selling 100 houses, 50 houses, 60 houses a year, that's a lot of production and it takes a lot of work and it's not something that somebody can really do on their own. Brad, tell us how you got in the real estate business, <clears throat> how that came about for you. It's a great question. When I was about 27, no, I'm sorry, 25. Last um, week. I was, yeah, exactly. I wish I was selling cars and I was acting because I used to be a bartender actor, like we all did in LA. And I was like, I'm going to make a little bit more money. I've always been good at sales. So I got into car sales and I was doing car sales. Everything's going well, doing my acting, everything's going well. And my mom got sick. My mom was 54 years old. She got Alzheimer's and she was in her last stages. Like her, she was already really losing her memory when we really figured it out. So my brothers and sisters said, Hey, we'll take care of mom. Don't worry. You just work on acting. You're going to be a star one day and you're going to do this. And I said, no, I said, I am responsible for mom, just like you. And I started trying to figure out what I could do to make a really good living and help take care of my mom. And I said, I'm going to get into real estate because I knew that if you're going to be in sales, you either want to be in insurance or you want to be in real estate because there's high money in each one. And insurance was residuals. I just, I was, my problem was I looked like a baby. Uh, at 25, I looked like I was 16. When I was on doing Say by the Bell, the new class, I was in my 20s playing like a 15 year old, 16 yeah. year old. So uh, insurance wasn't for me. So I got into um, real estate and I used to bring my mom with me on appointments because there was no one to really take care of her. And I would say, mom, can you sit in the corner over here? We'll go to McDonald's later. Cause she ended up, I used to say, I am my mother's father. I ended up along with my brothers and sisters. We were the parents for my mom mm. taking care of her and doing things. So that's really long story short, how I got into it. Boy, Brad, that must've been tough. I give you a lot of credit. It can't, couldn't have been easy. That's for sure. It, you know what? It wasn't, but it actually, really gave me purpose and made me who I am today. It's uh, part of molding who you are as a person and, and an adult growing up. Yeah. Those struggles sometimes really shape our character, don't they? Yeah, they do. Definitely. Yeah. Hey, one thing I always ask people on the show is I, I want you to tell the listeners in one word, what makes you up? Give me one word that, that describes you personally and professionally. Good character or character. Character. Yeah. Very good. It's good. You know, it's always nice to uh, see how people describe themselves. So with all your knowledge and expertise, what's your real passion about the real estate business today? My real passion with real estate is I absolutely love helping people. There's my business is probably 97% referral or past clients. And my clients just keep coming back and keep coming back. And I can sell anywhere in California. And I can't tell you the amount of times that I've flown across the state to help someone buy a house because they trust me. Yeah. And they know that my negotiating skills are the best and that I care about them, that I, I never, ever put my commission before my client's needs ever. And I always feel like that's the most important thing. It, and that really excites me and makes me happy when I see my client's face and I know that I've made a difference in their life. And especially when they're young, when they're young or when they're in that move where they're about to move up, because I know that I'm making a difference in their financial future and I can give them good advice. Cause I, I tell my clients, I say, listen, one bad move can cripple you financially. So if we look at cycles and we look at how things are going and we really come up with a strategy for each individual client, that makes a big difference. And that's how you become somebody's real estate agent for life. So you, you said something interesting. You said one bad, one bad move and it could cripple you for life. Yeah. What expound on that a little sure, bit? Sure, sure, sure. And in California, you make big equity. There's especially Los Angeles where I am. So I'll give you an example. In 2000 and, 2001, I had sold 
I'll give you a perfect example, actually. So I had sold a house in 2001 my, to myself. I, I had sold one, uh, a condo I was living in for, I bought it for $189,000 and I thought I was rich. Sold it for 205000 like six months later. I'm like, wow, I made some good money. Now I turned around and I bought another house with that money. And I, I got, that was in 2003. And then around 2005, the house that I bought for 259 with that money, I put about a hundred grand into it and it was worth $630,000. Now that's big equity in California. So I said to my wife at the time, I said, listen, we're moving. She goes, what do you mean we're moving? Like I'm nine months pregnant or eight months pregnant. What are you crazy? I go, no, we're moving because I knew that the market was going to go down. Now, when I talk about you, you could get in trouble financially being crippled. If I would have waited and all of a sudden the real estate market went down, which it did, and all, all of a sudden I couldn't afford that house, what do you do? But by me selling that house, taking all of that equity, putting it into my next house, it set me up for a bad market. I knew I was going to be able to be in the house I wanted to be in for the next 10 years, which now I've been here 15. And not only that, I was going to be able to afford the payment because it was a lower payment than the smaller house. So that's interesting. So you bought the house for 259. Yeah. And you sold it for six. 630. Okay. So what was the, when you sold it for 630, what was the next house price you bought? 775. Oh, so you did go up. I thought you would have come, come or some in between. No, I went up. I had twins coming. Oh, I needed so. a bigger house. So I went from about 1391 to almost 3000 square feet. Yeah. I'm actually still in the house. Nice. Um, I'll sell that in the next couple of years as I see the market turn. If I can time it right, which I think I'll be able to, I'll sell that and then I'll make my next move, which will probably downsize. So that's interesting. You said if I can time it. So raises a great question. Can a real estate investor really ever time the market? Great question. I don't think any of it can really time it perfect because in LA we have earthquakes and you have all sorts of different things. You just never know. Can't plan Fire. for the unknown, right? <laughs> Fires, you've seen the news. So you can't really plan for the unknown. But what you can try to do is look at cycles. As a real estate agent, I know when the market's going to take a turn because we start to hear first about the foreclosures coming. You start to get letters from National Association of Real Estate, CAR, California Association of Real Estate. And you'll start to see things like foreclosures are coming, short sales are coming. I personally work with a lot of banks where I do foreclosures. I get notices from those banks saying, hey, we've got a notice of default uptick. And can, can you time it perfect? No, but can you, my advice is you should always talk to an experienced real estate agent who's been through different cycles. Cycles are a big thing. Um, Huge. Here's what I know, though, and, and I tell people this all the time. I say, look, I, I've made money in up markets. I've made money in down markets. I've yeah. made, made money when the Republicans have been in office. Yeah. I've made money when the Democrats. You're a money machine. Listen, it's about just buying right at the time of what's going on. So That's right. That's here, right. And here's an interesting question, right? Knowing where we're at in, in this time with this pandemic and the the moratorium yeah. on evictions that's sure. Been, on and restaurants closed, people not making money. And you think there's going to be some good deals in the next few months? So great question. Great question. Do I think there's going to be good deals in the next few months? No. Do I think there's going to be good deals in the next year and a half? Yes. I think what's going to happen is there's a forbearance, right? And that's been letting a lot of people not pay their mortgages. However, there really hasn't been a clear set plan on what's going to happen when this ends. Are they going to be asked to pay the whole thing in full right away? Are they going to be asked to put it on the back end and raise their mortgage payment, which some people will be able to afford, some people won't. Even if someone said, hey, I'll give you $100,000 off your mortgage, lower your payment down to a minimum. If they don't have a job, it's they're not going to be able to pay. Yeah. So they'll be underwater. And that's where we're going to find out. So I do think the, the banks that I've been talking to, Michael, are talking about the third quarter of 2021, you're going to start to see a shift. That's interesting. I've heard a lot of different opinions and, and I don't even know that I have an opinion other yeah. than the, here's a conversation I had with somebody yesterday, though. They said with this 
who said, hey, I've got five properties for sale. They're probably valued, all five of them. Now, they're not in the best areas, about 220000 for all five of them. Oh. That's a, five wow. houses for the price of your first one, right? Yeah, it's amazing. And he said, I'll let them go today for about 175 I said, that's interesting. I said, tell me about your tenants. He goes, oh, that's a bad question. I said, what do you mean it's a bad question? He said, yeah, oh, three of them haven't paid in 10 months. Yeah. Said, oh boy, they heard that. They heard our governor's news of, that they didn't have to pay and they wouldn't get kicked out. He goes, absolutely, they're working the system. Yeah. I think that the investor that owns a house with a mortgage on it today is probably in worse trouble than a homeowner Great point, Michael. And I tell people that all the time. I go, what about the guy who owns five houses that was relying on the rent every month to pay those mortgages because he was trying to put himself and his family in a better position for later on in life? What happens to him? Yeah. That poor guy or that poor girl. Yeah. And, and that's a really tough situation to be in. And that's another reason why I talk about catastrophes with your financial future, you have to have a plan and a strategy. And going forth with my investors, one of the things I'm going to be doing is sitting down with them and saying, okay, let's plan. What happens if COVID hits? What do we do? What happens if this, do you, maybe we should have a year in reserves rather than three months. One of my, one of the questions I always like to ask is how do you make high stake decisions? So those are, there's some decisions you're faced with yeah. as an investor, as a real estate mm -hmm. agent, somebody as a coach. Yeah. How do you help your client make decisions? Again, so you sit with them and you strategize and you find out, A, really what their net worth is. Can they survive a storm? And then you want to come up with a strategy and you want to, you want to evaluate risk versus reward. Can they handle the risk and what kind of reward are they looking for? I mean, if I'm doing an investment... <coughs> I'm cool with a 5% return on my money, especially on a rental that's coming in. It's more than I'd make in the banks and it's a good, decent return. Some people say, hey, no, I'd rather sell right away and make a 30% return. For me, that's not enough If for selling. I'd rather hold onto a property, rent it out, hold onto a property until it's really worth some money, especially in LA, right? Because you can take, buy a house for 250, rent it out for a few years and then sell it for 630 later. Who wouldn't want to do that? And so, if you could do that all day long, that's a great. You really can if you have the money when the market goes down and you, again, you look at cycles. You look at the last two, three, four cycles because you figure every 10, 12 years, the market takes a little bit of a shift. Yeah. And you figure that out. Yeah. So let's talk multifamily for a minute because sure. what I really want to talk about, and I, it, you're alluding to it here, is economies of scale, right? So that investor who owns one single family house or owns several single family houses mm -hmm. and he's got a mortgage, let's just call it a thousand dollar mortgage. Okay. And he's got a tenant living in there paying $1,200 a month rent, but not paying because of the moratorium. He's paying that thousand dollars out of his pocket. Now that's pretty painful for a real estate investor. That's why I always talk about, multifamily because multifamily gives you the economies of scale where if you've got a four unit or a 20 unit and a percentage of your tenants aren't paying rent some are you're still able to soften the blow on your own pocket and where do you see investors fitting into that mix today around that so the investors that I deal with generally are single family. We do have several, so I do have several clients who like to do both. And when I do that, I usually pull in a partner uh, who specializes in multifamily and we go from there. But I can tell you that one thing I love about apartment buildings and things of that nature are people generally seem to be paying their rent. It's interesting. You get the guy who's renting the house from one person and they fuck the system. You get the guy who's paying a thousand bucks actually here, believe it or not, in LA, a one bedroom goes for about 1800, a one bedroom. And you, but you get the one bedrooms at 1800 or the two bedrooms at 2300 and people seem to be paying them. They just, I, I don't know what it is, but there isn't a real high turnover from the people, my investors that I've spoken to. They're pretty happy. Yeah. Commercials getting killed. 
when you say commercial, you mean like office and retail and, and that? Yeah. Stuff? Yeah. Big time, big time. Yeah. Their leases have been getting restructured and there's been lease reductions and just, it's been crazy. And I think in LA, at least, I don't know about Chicago, but in LA, a lot of people are uh, starting to build uh, multi-use. So they're getting rid of half of their buildings and making, turning them into on the bottom restaurants and cleaners and things that, things that they can make some more revenue with. Yeah. Yeah. We got around a little bit, especially in the urban areas. It's interesting. Some of the urban, like where I live in Chicago yeah. and Chicago, the people are moving out of the city. Because- yeah. And I heard the same in New York. I heard the same thing in New York. They're moving out of the city because they can work at home now. So yeah. they can go live in a cheaper area in a suburb. Exactly. Hey, what, what are some of the lessons that you've learned over the years? So you've been in the business a while. Give a couple of lessons that you've learned that really make a difference in your business and your career. As far as poor lessons, I can tell you one that I did with, it was a horror. It was a big learning lesson for me, but it was tough to swallow. I had a, uh, there was one month Look, we can, it, it's high risk, high reward in real estate as and I've, we've talked about it. And, and there was a month I made, gosh, I think it was 142,000. And I said to my wife, I'm like, look, there's a guy at the office who has some really good food he's been bringing in and he wants to open a restaurant and there's a bunch of guys who are putting in and I want to go for our future and just throw some money in. She's like, I don't want you to do that. I'm like, no, it's just 30 grand. Who cares? And I gave him 30 grand. He had a bullshit perspective, prospectus, excuse my language, by the way, prospectus and editor. And I just, so my problem was, is I looked at it and I just didn't, again, I was younger. I was only in the business seven, eight years and I didn't put enough thought into it and I didn't study it well enough and I didn't really know anything about it. And I was looking for passive income. And what I should have done was invested in an apartment building. Instead, I gave $30,000 to a guy who never opened up a restaurant. And there was several of us that lost the money. He probably walked away with 120000 never opened anything. So that was a really bad experience in investing. Really good learning experience. But it cost me because the market went down a couple of years later and I could have really used that money. That never, I've never gotten over that. Financially, I have. But emotionally, I carry it like a, an open wound. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how, how we go through those times in our lives where we have those types of situations and those are what shape us a little bit or shape how we make decisions. So the next time you're faced with that type of a choice or that type of a yeah. situation, a little bit more about how to evaluate it. Yeah. And I equate, I equate what you're saying to the first multifamily deal I ever did. I was so excited about getting this deal closed that we didn't do any due diligence. And yeah. I believed everything the seller said. And we bought this bag of bricks. Mm-hmm. And it was like, oh, now what? You all of a sudden become a don't wanter and wanted somebody to stop the pain. But that's how we learn. And I think that's that's part of life. Definitely. So this show's called the Insider Secrets. Give the listeners a, a secret, an investing secret, sure. tip, strategy, something sure. that you look at. Yeah. So let me tell you, as a real estate agent, what I told an investor yesterday. So I have a new investor who has been calling me and wanting to buy a piece of land from me. And she's very excited about it. And she, I don't feel, has been doing her due diligence. And I, I, listen, I represent the seller and I can, and I'll represent her as the buyer. However, she, when I ask her qualifying questions like, Hey, okay, I'm sending you up with the hard money guy. If that doesn't work out, what are you going to do? Oh, we have cash. Okay. Where's the cash coming from? One of my partners, just write the offer. It's okay. Everything will be fine. And I said, Hey, wait. So investors that are listening to Michael's core intention show, listen to this very carefully. Here's what I told her. I said, real estate agents, I said, can I give you a secret? She said, sure. I said, real estate agents hate when an investor calls us and says, don't worry about where it's coming from. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. We see red flags. We see escrows not closing. We see egg on our face. We want to do things right. And we need to set you up for success. 
So if you're an investor, new or old, but generally this happens with new ones, you should do your due diligence. You need to figure out a plan. You need to, to look, go on a computer, go on an Excel spreadsheet, go on Word, anything, type, figure out where you're going to get your money from and have a plan A, B, and C. If you're asking me to do work and write offers and do things for you and you aren't prepared, I, I don't want to work with you. I see it coming. So a, a lot of people call themselves investors, Michael. They're not. They're not. Plan, planning is such a part of the process, isn't it? It's huge. It's huge. And there's so many ways you can really get hurt. Again, the first time investor who says, I'm going to be, make, be a millionaire because I'm going to buy this property. I'm going to build on it. I'm going to make money. You have to say to yourself, okay, I'm going to buy this property at this time of my life. What if the market goes down? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if I can't get the permits? How is this going to affect you? Are you using all your money? Yeah. Yeah. Where's the rest of the capital? Hey, so what, what should investors look for in the marketplace today? So if they're out looking, shopping a deal, what should they look for today? I think that they need to identify what their core intentions are. What are your intentions? Did you get paid for that? Spot? Like that okay. core intentions, guys, an exit strategy, exit plan. But what are their core intentions? What do they want to, what do they want to do? Do they want to flip it or do they want to hold it? Are they okay with either? What do they want to make? So they really have to have a plan in, in order to decide what, you know, what they want to do. Is there a good, well, look, People say, and I hate hearing this too, I want a deal. I want a good deal. Listen, if you would have bought a house six months ago when you were complaining about you wanted a deal and you said it wasn't a deal, today that house looks like a deal or that multifamily. So barring a bad market in this economy, everything's really going up. So it's to say, I want a deal. You shouldn't be as concerned about a deal, especially if you're holding on to something. What you should be concerned about it. Is it going to pay me a passive income of what I'd like? Is it going to pay off the actual asset? How long will it take? And then again, what are my intentions? What do I want to do? Do I want to, do I want to uh, put 50% down now, wait for the market to go up a bit and then pull my money back out and have it pay for itself? What do you want to do? That's really the key question. So that goes back to, and one of the things I really work with my coaching clients on is the why. Why are you doing this? It's one thing to have a goal set. And Brad, if I told you, hey, I want to make more money in 2021, you know, what, why? First, yeah, first of all, what is that? That's not really a goal. It's not measurable, attainable. It's not, you could give me 10 bucks and say, there's more money for you. So uh, it's it, today you have to be specific in what you want, but I always try to lead people to, Hey, what do you, why do you want that? What's important about that to you? And a lot of times people go, I just, I want to buy a bigger house or, but that there's more behind that. What does that represent in somebody's life? So it's the same thing with building that strategy. So if you're planning, how, tell me a process on you, you're going to buy an investment property. Give me your planning process around. Sure. First thing I do is I, I run, I, I figure out when the, the top of the market was last. And I look and I say, okay, if the top of the market was, let's say 2007 last time, right? I want to know what it sold for at the top of the market last time compared to what I'm buying at now. We do know it will. They, usually they exceed themselves each market. But then I also want to look at it what was it worth at the bottom? Well, so if there was an asset that was worth a million dollars at the top and $400,000 at the bottom, can I sustain that? If I have to sell at the 400 because I'm broke or something happens, and this is how I talk to my clients. If you're broke and you have to, can you sustain it? What can you do? And they say, oh, don't jinx me. It's not about that. We have to come up with a solid plan, right? Let's figure it out. So the very first thing I do, Michael, is go through and I look at cycles. I look at what things were selling for in the worst, what they sold for in the best. Then I look at and I try to figure out how much time I think is left in the cycle. And then we talk about, again, really, what, are you, what do you want out of this? What are your intentions? Yeah. 
So that research isn't that hard to do either. Very easy. Explain. So walk some in walk through how you, if you were sure. not a real estate broker, how would you walk somebody through doing that? I'd call a real estate broker immediately, <laughs> but, and I would <laughs> that network, but if not, but it, yeah, you could always surely. And, and guys, I'll tell you, this is a really good thing to do. Start building relationships with real estate agents. If you build a relationship and someone calls me and goes, Hey, Brad, look, I'm about to get in this deal. I'm sorry. You can't be a part of it. Uh, I was buying it. It's in another state or, Hey, it just came, fell in my lap, but I, you can't be a part of it, but I do trust you. Could you give me some advice? I'll be like, sure, no problem. Why? Because I like to help people for one. For two, I'm building a relationship with someone. And I would be more than happy to run the comps. And, all, and the comps, look, if you're, if you, there's a difference between running comps in the last six months to see if you're buying at market value. And there's a difference between buying, running comps and looking at cycles. And cycles, you may have a more difficult time running if you're not a real estate agent to get really accurate ones because you can go to some online sites, but they're not always that accurate. So that's why I say it's best to try to build a relationship with a realtor. And don't feel bad about calling a realtor, even if it's a newer one who wants to earn your business. Call them and say, hey, be honest. Don't try to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. Say, hey, look, I don't have anything for you for this deal, but I'm looking to build relationships. Can you help me uh, figure out a price? Uh, you can do it so quickly. Really quickly, I could come up with a strategy for somebody. How about, let's talk about a rehab real quick. And sure. somebody's, I like talking shop a little bit. So yeah. when, when you're buying an investment property and it needs to be rehabbed, how do you go about picking and why this came to mind is you, we talked a little bit about network, right? If you don't know a broker, go yeah. meet one and build a network of those. It's the same thing with contractors. Yeah. How do you go about picking a broker or a contractor that will work with you? So brokers are a little easier. They're not working for you as long. Contractors are tough. I get some contractors that are amazing that get in and get out. And then 90% of them, and I think the contractors will tell you themselves, if they're working on a job too long, they get burnt out. So if it's a job that's going to take six months, Oftentimes you might go through a couple different contractors or a couple different tradesmen. It's just the way it is. Unfortunately, contractors, at least in LA, don't generally save their money as well. So they're using one month, some money from one job to get to another job. I would give you the best advice I can give you guys is sign a contract with a contractor, a, a licensed contractor who's going to do stuff in phases and they only get paid after the completion of each phase. If you pay them half up front, or hey, more, and they haven't finished where they said they were going to be, uh, you can often find yourself in a pickle. Yeah, you should never pay somebody more than 10% going into a contract. Yeah. Enough and, for supplies, yeah. And then a little bit more at demo. And you know, right. those, those payments should be staggered so that you, here's one piece of advice when, you, when it comes to money and contractors, never let your contractor get ahead of you financially. You That's always right. get ahead of the contractor financially. And that well, that means that he should be out of pocket on material and labor, being yeah. able to cover it and you catching up later, catching yeah. them up later. And don't be afraid to ask your contact contractor those questions when you're interviewing them. Yeah. Hey, look, I'm, I want you to be out of pocket some money. I want you to understand that we're partners here and I want to give you a lot of deals, Yeah. but I need to make sure that you're in this with me. And before that's my background, before I got into the real estate business, I was in the general contracting business and I never let my homeowner get ahead of me or get behind me financially. I was, they were always ahead of me financially and it, it just always made for a much better relationship because there's always an issue on the back end. So yeah, there is. It, it's a, and, there's a and what do we say, Michael? We always tell our investors what prepare for the unexpected. If you're budgeting for 30, budget yourself for 60. Just budget sure for the worst. But That's it. Like I hope best. for the best. Hey, listen, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's go to a little lighter note. Sure. You're in uh, beautiful Southern California. Right. Except for the smoke sometimes. Ooh. Favorite tourist attractions. 
I'm a Disneyland guy. When you have children, they love it. And I just, I enjoy going to, I enjoy, I'm a Southern Cal guy who won't go to Disneyland at seven in the morning and leave at four or eight at night. I want to go, I'll go get a passes for the whole family. And then we'll stay three or four days at a hotel and just get it all out. We do it like once every couple of years and, I, and I'm set. Nice. We only live 15 minutes from Magic Mountain, which is fun too, but it's a little hot in the summer. So yeah, I bet. I bet. Favorite restaurant? Shibuya Sushi. Oh, nice. Yeah, sushi. It sounds good. So Shibuya is in uh, Calabasas, where my office is. It's where, for those of you who are listening all over the country, it's where the Kardashians live. That's where my office is. And Shibuya, Shibuya, Shibuya is the freshest, most phenomenal sushi. Well, that might be a tourist attraction. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> Best book you've read? Oh, are you kidding me? The greatest salesman in the world. Ogmandino. That's it, baby. God. Love it. Love it. I have one and two here, actually. Anything Ogmandino is fabulous. Yeah. That was probably one of the first books I ever read. You know what I, I have sitting over here that I'm reading right now is As a Man Thinketh. Oh. No? Oh, hmm. my gosh. I'll have reading, to look it up. This is it. Oh, it's great. Little tiny one, Little huh? Book. Yeah. James Actually. Allen by James Allen. Probably the granddaddy of positive thinking. That's the most important, right? Positive thinking. And he says right in the book, he just tells you, look, if you think good things are going to happen, if you don't think good thing, not good things are going to happen. Yeah, it's cra it's crazy. It's, it's the power. It's the power of the mind. That's it. Most memorable moment in the last six months. I always like this because of the pandemic going on. So people have been locked up and not going out. And... I would say in the last six months, we'd definitely say uh, pandemic. I would say, funny enough, I got a tattoo. I'm, fi I'm 50 years old, never had a tattoo. I think I'm going through a midlife crisis and I got a tattoo. And, and that was very memorable for me. It was actually, I love that. some people go buy a Ferrari, you buy, you get a tattoo. I, I got a tattoo and, uh, and a big one on my, you can't see it because with, even with the short sleeve, it was from my shoulder here down to about my sleeve. And I got a really beautiful sunset with the ocean, really blue ocean. I got the sand in front. And then I had the word gratitude written in the sand. And then I have two birds off to the right, which were, are my mom and dad, because they're both in heaven now. And it really is beautiful. And, it, and I love it. I love looking at it. Nice. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> so and uh, gratitude's so important, right? Yeah. You know, uh, that's been my, with Thanksgiving, I, we're going to date this a little bit now, right? Thanksgiving is this week, but when we're recording this, I, I, I put some social media out there yesterday. And I said, listen, I said, why do we only count our blessings or be grateful for things on Thanksgiving? When right. we're sitting around and somebody says, hey, what are you grateful for today? When I think every day we should be grateful. Every day. Years ago, I, st I, I started journaling three to five things every day that I was grateful mm -hmm. for. And you know what? It doesn't have to be anything big, Brad. It could be the air you breathe or that you stood up that morning. Yeah. It it's incredible. It's a great thing to do. And it's a great way to keep it top of mind. So don't, I think a lot of times you find more happiness and really can open the window to your soul. Through that's very profound, Michael. Very profound. Yeah, a little bit. I think that's old age, right? Yeah, it is. We get, we get more grateful as we, hopefully you get more grateful when you have more gratitude. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's for sure. Listen, this has been a blast. I'm glad that you were here today. And I love talking shop and there, we got into some good shop stuff here. How do, how do the listeners get a hold of you if they want to pick your brain or get sure. in touch? Sure. So you can go to my website at atrepodcast.com. Now it's all things real estate is the name of my podcast, all things real estate. And it's atrepodcast.com. You can go on and get, if you want to pick my brain, you can sign up for a free 30 minute conversation with me. You can also email me atrepodcast at gmail.com, atrepodcast at gmail.com. And I hope that your listeners would like to listen to my show as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and I can tell my listeners that I have listened to your show and I've been on your show. 
So yeah. they can go listen to my show on your show. Definitely. And I think, oh gosh, I wanted to say your show will be airing in January. Good. So, um, we kick off the new year, Brad. Right? Well, By hey, core intentions. Everyone's got to have an exit plan for whenever in life. And I figured if I put you on in January, they can really get going on their goals. Yeah. Just so the listeners know, I did not pay for those two commercials just now. <laughs> Go buy the book Exit Plan. and Right. It's a good that. book. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody, hey, thanks for being here. Another Tuesday afternoon. Way to wrap it up, Brad. It's been a pleasure. And we will look forward to seeing you all next Tuesday again. Brad. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for joining us for another great episode of Insider Secrets. As always, Insider Secrets is brought to you by My Core Intentions. Join us on social media and visit MyCoreIntentions.com where you can get expert coaching on all things multifamily investing and property management. We're looking forward to having you back again next week for more Insider Secrets.